Guy here with a quick message before we get on with the pod. As a thank you to our most dedicated and loyal viewers and listeners to Blood Red, we're inviting you to join our Blood Red Club. By joining, you'll get access to insider transfer content as well as interviews with former favourites and those connected at Anfield. All you need to do is head to bloodredpodcast.co.uk, enter your email address, and our exclusive content will head to your inbox. That's bloodredpodcast.co.uk. Thanks. Now on with the show. This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. It's the Blood Red Podcast, courtesy of the Liverpool Echo. I'm Guy Clark. Thanks for joining us. Pre-season plans outlined, Harvey Elliott contract confirmed, and the rumour mill threatening to spin off its axis here, as ever, to get into the latest Liverpool talking points. Today we have Joe Rimmer and David Lynch. Gents, I hope you're both well. Uh, Lynch, I'll, I'll throw to you first. We'll get into the, the pre-season plans, and Liverpool finally have sort of confirmed something. We've been waiting a little while, but they're off to Austria. Yeah, um, it's sort of similar plan to last year, really, I suppose, because of the, the COVID restrictions. Obviously, you can't do a, a normal pre-season tour and go to somewhere like America. Um, so I think the, the next best thing, as far as Liverpool are concerned, is to, to take them away to, to somewhere in Europe. And I think I think the idea from, from Klopp's side of things is, is you know, if you can't do a pre-season tour, you know, you, you would just think, oh, well, why can't they just go to Kirby, do the training there, and then maybe have a pre-season friendly against Tranmere or whoever. Uh, Berry and, and local sides like they have done traditionally in the past in, in early pre-season but I think his priority in that period really is to sort of get them together in a group and, and, and you know put them in a situation whereby even the, the free time is together and, and you know you really create that strong bond amongst the squad and really helps new signings to, to integrate as well so um, yeah I think that's the thinking so yeah off to Austria where, they, where they've been before and, and they like and you know that they've got a good good training set up there and, and I think being in, in the middle of Europe as well gives them a, an opportunity to sort of strike up a few friendlies as well, doesn't it? So yeah, it should be should be good preparation for the new season. Yeah, it strikes me, Joe, this preseason is going to be really important, kind of hitting the reset after everything that's gone on over the sort of the last year and a half or whatever since Project Restart really got underway, that it is sort of time to start afresh and go again. And I suppose that preseason camp right from the off is is a great chance to do that. Yeah, as Dave just said, I think what did Linda say, they need back to basics. And I think that's really important for Liverpool. It's important for these players. And, you know, it's important the ones that are in the Euros and the Copper America, they also get a good break. But, um, you know, I miss the, the Tramir ones quite like those early friendlies. I always think, there's, you know, it's, it's nice that they do some of the local clubs. Um, but, yeah, I think this will be, be really good for morale. It'll be really good for fitness and for, you know, just refreshing those players and uh, going off to Austria and those sort of stunning backdrop that you know the places they train in so um really important massively crucial pre-season you know Liverpool haven't really had a break in a, in a long time now so hopefully they come back refreshed and you know we know when this team is fresh when they're not totally out on their feet and battling with a million injuries we know how good they can be so you know got really high hopes for the season coming and, and pre-season's you know, the first chance for players to put down a marker to get themselves into Klopp's plans and there's some, some players in that squad that I'm sure will come to that you know will will sort of be either in the last chance saloon if you like or or just wanting to remind Klopp or some of the young players who are desperate to sort of show him that they could be part of the first team squad so it's just such an important time and it's quite an exciting time for fans isn't it we all like to see those first pictures of them out there trading in the in the new gear and all that so um, really looking forward to it I like this time of year yeah I was going to say obviously there there are a couple of international games to, to get out of the way at the weekend. Two finals that Liverpool do have a, a, a small passing interest in, David, but it is now sort of on the horizon, the return of the club action and obviously the tour that's going to be going on in Austria. As you said, Pep Linders has said it's back to basics. At the moment, we've got the word fluid going around. It does sort of feel the complete polar opposite to what you would normally expect maybe of a pre-season money-spinning tour. This is very much right. The training's all been set out and that's prepared and readied. Even the friendlies, we we've no idea at this stage exactly what's going on. Yeah, I think I think that element of it, they would probably say, is not ideal. I think you know they, they do like to plan everything, don't they? You know, completely and, and to the nth degree. But they've not had the opportunity to do that just because you know it, you know let's not forget things are getting better in this country, but we're still very much in a pandemic, aren't we? There's, there's you know it's not just the fact that the leaving these friendlies till late but they, you know there's an acknowledgement that you know 
say that the the situation in Austria changes very quickly, they might have to get out of there very quickly and, and, and get back to the UK and, and you know, you've got to really protect the players and the staff. So um yeah, it's it's possibly not ideal that scenario, but I think they'll know they've got that basis at least on a training front. Okay, so you know, they they've got the time and, and the facilities there to, to get in some really good training which they really value. Um, you know, if they do have any slight change of system or approach this season, this is the time when they'll do it. They'll embed those, you know, tactical principles in, in the team and, and so I think they know that they'll get the time to do that. The friendlies are by the by and I'm sure they you know, they won't have any problems finding opposition because there's plenty of teams out there who are in in a similar position in their season, just getting ready for the new one. So um but yeah, so that that's maybe not ideal that they're going to have to sort those late on. But I think they'll know that they've got enough time in the training pitch, and that that is the the, the time that Jurgen Klopp really values. Yeah, most definitely. So a thirty-four man squad will be reporting sort of from the from day one of preseason, which which is on Monday. Joe, the likes of Manny and Salah are both in there. Of course, those away at the Copa America and, and Euros are being given an extended leave, but also the likes of Virgil Van Dijk, Joe Gomez, and and Trent are all involved as well. Pretty strong squad, isn't it? You know, yeah. um, probably usually stronger than you, you see at this time of year. So. That's quite good for Liverpool. And, and there's some players in there, you know, Dave's done a piece for later on, of players that will be really desperate to impress. You know, it's, it's a big summer, isn't it, for people like Joe Gomez, people like Naby Keita. So, you know, a lot of them will want to hit the ground running, keep themselves fit, get themselves into the absolute best possible shape. And I'm sure, you know, they'll all, be, they'll all have been do, doing that anyway throughout the summer. You know, you only need to follow Salah on Instagram to know, you know, that these guys are in tip-top shape, aren't they? So, but... Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting squad, isn't it? You know, Gruwich is in there, Carius, and then there's some some young players as well. So, um, a nice mix, and it'll be interesting. I think it is a really good good time for them and a big opportunity for some of those players. And look, if they're struggling for friendlies, I'm sure sure we can get some. We could get the Echo team. I, mean, <laughs> I think we have, we haven't played in a while. Have we, Sam Carroll can't can't organise a. I can't say the word. A pee up in a brewery, can he? So we could get if we could get the Echo team together. James Pearce still plays up front. He's, he's never relinquished his, his place there. You're in goal, aren't you, Guy? Yeah, I've got the tracks of bombs, yeah. Alison style, yeah. 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 I'd like Gabo to put a bit Pirali of pressure on James Pearce. Is, is that what you're playing, <laughs> isn't she, up front? I can do, yeah. I've learned <laughs> <the time. laughs> James, James has never given up his spot. He um, he always plays up front and never subs himself off either. He still half manages the team. So, you know, it could be a really exciting game. I reckon you and James <laughs> up front as a little duo could give... Give Gomez and Van Dyke a real test. Give Canate the new guy. Uh, well, test. yeah. Oh, if they were still on crutches, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely. But it, it, in terms of sort of even looking at that squad and players wanting to impress, we, we do, in the social media age, get the players on their pre-pre-seasons, as it were, getting themselves ready. And Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, for one, seems to very much be getting himself into tip-top shape, ready to, to crack on from day one. Yeah, the, the, there's an opportunity there in midfield. I think, obviously, we know that Liverpool are, are looking at some options there after losing Genie Wijnaldum. And I, I do think they need to add someone there because I, there's no real obvious air to, to, to Wijnaldum in terms of picking up the, just the sheer amount of minutes that he did last season. He was just unbreakable, wasn't he? Brilliant. Um, so, you know, the, but there's still an opportunity until Liverpool sign someone there. And even if they do sign someone, they're going to have to have that adaptation period. Then there's, there's a real chance for someone to sort of stake a claim certainly to start the season in that position. I think Oxley Chamberlain, you know, he, he gets written off a lot, but he was he was fit for quite a lot of last season. He, you know, he didn't have, struggle with a lot of injuries once he got over that that one he not the knock on his knee he got in preseason. Once he was sort of past that, he was he was available pretty consistently. I think what what really sort of made it difficult for him to get chances was was all the injuries in other parts of the pitch and and, and Klopp just wanted some consistency in, in every every area he could find it really. So that made it hard to get game time. But you know he's he is a big talent, and if he can stay fit, he can make a big contribution. I think it, it gets you know easily forgotten that he was a top scorer behind the front three in the the season that Liverpool won the league. He's you know that the, that goal threat from midfield. I don't really think anyone else has, has offered that in that way. Um, you know in in this squad really, to be honest. So um, yeah, th that's a real opportunity for him. So if he can come in the preseason, really impress the manager, and hit the ground running, and just stay fit again, then yeah, the, the chances should be there for him. Yeah, he'll turn 28 in the early weeks of the season, Joe. I just wonder with Alex Oxlade Chamberlain if if now this is his time maybe to look at that hole in the midfield and think actually 
there's been a lot of talk around him, even from early days at Southampton, that the central midfield position was his favoured role. He's been used here, there and everywhere. Can he finally now think to himself, actually, there is an opportunity. I'll keep myself fit and, and maybe actually deliver on, on the promise that we all know that he's got. I'm sure watching England doing what they're doing, he's thinking to himself, in the peak years of my career, I should have been involved in that squad. Yeah, look, I, I've always really liked Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain. I, I rate him really highly. I think he's, you know, gives Liverpool something completely different. Being brutally honest, I don't think he's ever going to be a player that starts for Liverpool week in, week out. But I think he's someone that, when fit, is a really put, important squad member because, he, you know, you can change the midfield up. You can put him in. And, you know, we've seen before when Liverpool have played, you know, some of the, the sort of mid-table teams or some you know, sort of bottom half of the table teams. He can be really important at just sort of when they're sitting deep, getting shots away from the edge of the box. So, you know, I, I really like him. And I think he could have a big role to play at Liverpool. It's just keeping himself fit. It's always been the issue for him. And to be fair, he suffered some really unlucky injuries, you know, things that I don't think you can put down to being, in inverted commas, injury prone. I think it, you know, the, the knee injury he obviously suffered in his first season was you know, a real extreme one. But if he can keep himself fit, I think he can be a real good option for Liverpool. And, and people have almost slept on a little bit. You know, I think you forget you forget the goals he scored, you know, in those first two seasons at Liverpool and and how he had big impacts and decent games. So, yeah, uh, fingers crossed for him. Um, it's a big season for him because I think if he doesn't get himself fit this summer and he doesn't force his way into the team by the end of this, this not into the team, but into the manager's plan, sorry, by the end of this summer, you know, I think Liverpool might, Come to a point where they did, they'd accept a bid for him, but I like him. I'd like him to stick around. I think he's a good option. Yeah, we always, I suppose, it's easy to forget as well. The, the last full house at Anfield, that Atletico Madrid game, albeit he was subbed off in that, but he was unbelievable in, in that match. He certainly got the quality. It's just about getting it out of him on a consistent basis. What about Ibrahima Konate, who's going to be joining up with Liverpool for the first time? Dave, he's, he's been waiting for this all summer. We've seen the content he's been sharing on social media. He seems to be absolutely thrilled at the prospect of, of coming into this team. Yeah, I don't, in a way that you don't really sort of tend to see from professional footballers, you know, they're usually yeah. so cool about it and this is this is all normal, I just play for Liverpool now and he seems like, you know, it's, it's like if one of us got the chance to, to sign for Liverpool, he's, he's really, really enthusiastic about it, which is great to see because, you know, he's got a big test, hasn't he, coming in now, he's you know, he's got to hit that level, he's got to show that he's worthy of pushing past the likes of Joe Gomez and Joel Matip. You know, and possibly has a chance, depending on where they're up to with the rehabilitation, to to really, really stake a claim in the, in these early preseason friendlies. So, um, yeah, but but I think you know the first thing that you want if you're a clock player is is that enthusiasm, that willingness to work. That you've got to want it because it'll put you through the ringer in preseason, certainly. So, um, you know that that looks like a really good start, and he he just seems like a really smart, fun, fun guy. And it, 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 we know he's obviously a talented footballer as well. So. It's, yeah, it's another good character added to the squad and, and really looking forward to seeing him in the Liverpool shirt. Yeah, he's definitely broken in his training gear, hasn't he, Joe? He's been running around Paris, I think, <laughs> in it all. Not, must be sleeping in it as well. But it, it's one of those, isn't it? It's easy to forget this is a 22-year-old lad who's been given the opportunity of a lifetime to come over to the Premier League, the biggest league in the world, and play for arguably the biggest club out there. Absolutely. I think we always forget how young footballs are. You know, I think about what I was doing when I was 22 and I was... It's a bit of a mess, really, and you think like these guys, you know, have got this this brilliant opportunity to play for one of the biggest clubs in the world. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can't wait to see him, to be honest, because I think he, he might take Liverpool fans and, you know, myself by surprise, because I think he's a little bit of a different player to what people expect. Um, you know, I was reading a few bits on him, Andrew Beasley did a piece for us yesterday, and, you know, he carries the ball out a lot. He seems to be someone that likes to get up the pitch, um, perhaps in the same style as Joel Mathip on those Maisie runs. So, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to him. And do you know what's really interesting, as Dave mentioned, you know, just, just earlier, someone like Joe Gomez, it, you know, Liverpool on, on paper now have some really good options there, don't they? They have Van Dijk, they have Gomez, they have Matip, and then they have Konate coming in. And Gomez and Van Dijk, well, so, so did Matip and Van Dijk, to be fair, but Gomez and Van, Van Dijk forged one hell of a partnership. And, you know, if Gomez had been fit, that could have been the partnership for Liverpool for years to come. But it's going to be interesting to see whether Konate can sort of disrupt that, whether he can, you know, finish the summer as, as the, the main man alongside Van Dijk. So, 
it's going to be a real battle. I can't wait to see him in action. And, um, you know, if he attacks his Liverpool career with the same enthusiasm as he's been attacking some of this pre-season stuff is with his training kit on. And I think he'll, he'll do fine. You know, he certainly has the right attitude. So can't wait to see him. Um, a really, really intriguing player. Yeah, he's, he's certainly got his mates on board doing his... I don't know what it was when he was getting the, the shirt out of the bag, Dave, and revealing his kit number. It all seemed a bit weird to me with the flares going off and, and whatnot. But I suppose almost maybe since Alberto Moreno left, there's not really kind of been that guy for Liverpool fans to have that kind of affectionate affection for through social media, I suppose. And it might be Konate who sort of takes on that, that mantle with the fans and endears himself, I suppose, in many ways. As Joe was saying, you, you, you're you getting to see him as a person before we've seen him on the pitch. And already you're thinking, I really I really hope this works out for him. Yeah, I think that maybe the difference with Moreno is, is some of that attracted a bit of criticism, didn't it? Because of performances, <laughs> yeah. you know, certainly yeah. from the, from a certain point onwards sort of didn't didn't live up to the to the hype and, and and he was struggling a little bit and then you get accused then of, of that being a distraction don't you if, if you're not performing well on the pitch even though that's obviously ridiculous because these footballers do have quite a bit of spare time to fill so why wouldn't they be walking the dogs through Sefton Park on a, a hoverboard thing so you know that <laughs> yeah that, why would that you? can happen yeah. that's what I do when my spare time anyway. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's hopefully. I, I think yeah, if, with Canate, if he lives up to expectations on the pitch, then that will it will be nice to you know have that that you, you do see that other side of him, and yeah, hopefully he just keeps up that enthusiasm and, and lives up to expectations on the pitch. Yeah. It's the one. It's the one big mystery, isn't it? That Liverpool, Liverpool centre back pairing for the first game of the season. You just you just can't. Nobody can call it at the moment, and you know for a team that to be fair. You, you could pretty much name Liverpool's strongest team in the last couple of years, you know, week in, week out. It's, the, the forward line hasn't changed much. Even the midfield, you know, is, is probably the, the, the area that changes a lot. But when Liverpool have had everyone fit, you could probably name that. But, you know, the centre-back pairing now, obviously we know Van Dijk could be in there, I'm, I'm sure. But alongside him, you just can't call it. So it's going to be really interesting there. And Konate, again, I've just said before, I can't wait to see him play because... I really don't know who's going to start alongside Van Dijk, and it could be a really tough decision for Klopp. Hopefully, hopefully it will be. Well, that's it, isn't it? As well, when you think back to to May and the way the season ended with eight wins in ten, it could well have been ten out of ten had the the Leeds United and Newcastle United games gone a different way. That was with a completely different centre back partnership to what we're going to see, and at the time that was the perceived weakness in it. But once you add Van Dijk in, and then Joe, as you're saying, those players battling for it, all of a sudden you're looking at it again as a real area of strength rather than a weakness within the side from which the rest of the team has a foundation to build from. Yeah, they've got, they got too many. They probably need to sell one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can go wrong? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we've we, seen that we one work add, before. If you add in as well the, 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 the fact that, and I know they will not want to do this this season at any point, but but that Fabinho plays there as well. It is, it is without doubt, it's the strongest area of the squad, isn't it? Which is... You know, it's such a difference to last season and, and the struggles they had in that position that, you know, hopefully, you know, having that strong foundation and knowing that if you'd be happy for any of those four to, to start a game at centre half in any game, um, that's, you know, it's, it's reassuring, isn't it? Because Liverpool have that basis to work from them, that defensive solidity, and that, you know, hopefully will we'll pay dividends and, in, in, you know, in terms of the performances this season. Yeah, you just have to hope that those players come back stronger than, or at least on the level they were when when they did get injured. One player in particular, though, who will be coming back stronger this season is, is Harvey Elliott. And today, Joey's signed a new five-year contract at Liverpool. An awful lot of excitement around what this lad could do this season. Yeah, and so there should be. I mean, he looks... He, he does look a genuine, genuine prospect, doesn't he? I mean, uh, anyone who watched football for a while, you can sort of tell, can't you? You just have a... It's like a gut feeling with certain players when the, when you see them in action. And Harvey Elliott is just one of those players, like, like say, Curtis Jones, I think, you know, you felt similar about Trent, you know, who the first time you see him, you think, this lad's a player. And, you know, he, the, the only thing that you wanted him to do was go out over a season and, and prove it. And he, he went and did that in spades last year by, by going into a tough league and, and shining. So, you know, He's 18 years old. It's 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 crazy, but I, I honestly think he could be a real option for Liverpool next season. You know, obviously he'll get his chance this summer to, to sort of show what he can do. But I, I do wonder whether Liverpool are 
are waiting on 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 making reinforcements up front because they'll have a good look at him because he will be a genuine option and if they think he's ready, I'm sure he'll be a big part of their plans for next season. So, you know, honestly, I, I can't describe how excited I am. He's, he's one of the most exciting Liverpool youngsters, I think, to come through in a good while. So, you know, with him, Curtis Jones and, and Trent still being a very young player, you know, it's a lot of excitement about youngsters who've come through. So, yeah, I mean, five-year deal. Um, he seems to be really committed, seems to love the club, just seems to... You know, like like we talked about Kanata earlier, just a character who just seems to be loving life at Liverpool and really appreciative of the fact that he's there and and living a dream. So that's what we love to see as fans. And you know, he's, if he's got the ability to back it up, then you know he'll go a long way at Liverpool. So again, another intriguing player this summer. Another another player who during this training camp um, has got a big opportunity. And you know, I, I wouldn't back against him being a big part of Liverpool squad. Come. Um, the end of the transfer window. And that's one of the things, isn't it, David? He's, he's coming back into pre-season and, I mean, say, for example, a player like Harry Wilson, in, in years gone by, you're saying he's coming back with a chance to impress and then Liverpool will make a decision, knowing that, for example, when he came back from Derby, that was an awful big jump he was going to have to take to prove himself in pre-season. Whereas with Elliot, obviously being 18, he's now been at the club two years since obviously arriving after the Champions League win. He's just continuing to take those steps, but everyone he does, he impresses every single step. That's it. I think I think with, you know, in the case of someone like Harry Wilson, it was maybe an, an acknowledgement that he would have to come and sort of really, really blow everyone away with his performances in pre-season to, to get an opportunity. Where the, with Elliot, I think it's basically... They, they feel and they know that that, that is going to happen because they you know this level of talent. You know, we, we say he's eighteen, but it's, that was the only turned eighteen in April. So you know, he spent the majority of last season dominating the championship as a seventeen-year-old who you know doesn't have a lot on him. He's not a big kid. He's just absolutely brilliant footballer, um, which I think just shows his level. He's got a ridiculous first touch. His vision plays with his head up constantly. Uh, his weight of pass is perfect and. And plays like someone who's, who's just much older than he is. And I think, I, I really do think there's an opportunity for him at Liverpool next season. Um, you know, they, they expect him to stick around. There's no there's no talk about a loan at the moment. And, and I don't think there will be because I think they know that, you know, in theory, what, what will happen and what should happen is that, you know, Jadon Shakiri is probably going to get off in, in, in pursuit of some more game time. And then, you know, if you're looking for a direct replacement in terms of a left-footed creator who plays off the right-hand side, you know, you've got Harvey Elliott there at the age of 18, who's just a, a really, really top-class option already. Um, I, I think that the, the chance is there for him to get minutes in that position. You know, it won't be all the time. It won't be won't be constantly in the team, but it's just a good amount of minutes to get him, you know, give him that development. And like we've seen with Curtis Jones, just slowly be bled into the team. And I think, I think that process starts next season because I think there's huge faith in Harvey Elliott. And I, I totally agree with Joe. I think he's one of the one of the biggest talents Liverpool have had in a long time. I think he's going to be England international and, and play a lot, a lot of games for Liverpool. It's one of those, isn't it? It's sort of the latest sort of hit for Michael Edwards and the recruitment team in, in the way in which they, they've sorted out the first team. And now they've had chance to scour the market for these young talents. OK, Sepp Vandenberg, he's going back out on loan to, to Preston North End in the Championship for this season. And he'll see what happens for him. But with a player like Harvey Elliott, Liverpool aren't finding or going to find themselves in the situation like Manchester City, where all of a sudden to hit homegrown quota rules, they're needing to spend big on a, a ready-made English star. Liverpool have Trent, who's come through the academy, Curtis Jones. Harvey Elliott will fill all of the, the homegrown quotas as well, given the age he joined Liverpool at. And then even on this tour, who's going away, you've got the likes of Kai Gordon and Misilovsky as well, Joe, who are there just bubbling away in the background and Liverpool not needing to go and kind of break the bank for bringing in some what are genuinely exciting young talents. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... A lot of them are unproven, but what I think is very impressive about Liverpool is is the way that they they bleed these young players into the team. You know, as Dave just said about Curtis Jones, it, it was it, it was massively impressive over how probably around eighteen months since he you know really burst onto the scene you know, with that goal against Everton. Curtis Jones has, has gradually improved and gradually built up his game time, and now you feel like right, he's he's a real option for Liverpool in midfield. You know, and he goes into the next season as a as a bona fide first teamer, and and Harvey Elliott seems to be another one. They've not rushed it. You know, there was a lot of excitement when he came in last summer, 
Um, was it last summer or the summer before last? Last summer, wasn't it? Uh, he came in, or the summer before last, was it? Summer before, yeah, it was 2019. So he's been yeah. there a while. So, you know, like they've not rushed it with him. They've, he's played in some youth games. He's played in some under 23s. Then they've sent him out on a quite a sensible loan. They've allowed him to be to grow. And, you know, this is the season when I think, like Dave just said, he won't play all the time, but he'll get more more game time. He'll play in the Cups. Um, and, you know, he'll come on leaps and bounds and I think give it a couple of years and he'll be in the first team. And they've done that with Curtis Jones. They did that really well with Trent. I think Liverpool are just set up. If you're a young player and you've got ability, there really is no better place. You know, I think Man City have done it very well with Foden, but, you know, there aren't that many players that have come through City. You know, and Chelsea again have done it recently with Mount, but they don't really have the track. It took record. 10 years to get them, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. even United, you know, I think struggle at times, whereas Liverpool seem to have this track record, certainly in recent years, of bringing through players. So it's really impressive. Um, you know, and, and I think by the end of next season, he'll be sort of a bona fide first team player. Yeah, well, that's obviously kind of players for, for the future and Harvey Elliott in particular. But let's talk about current transfer policy then. Transfers are the, the commodity that seem to to make everything spin round. So we'll, we'll get into them. And uh, Dave, want to go straight in on Sal Niguez, the Atletico Madrid midfield player. Reports in Spain suggesting a, a 40 million euro deal may well be in the offing. I mean, he's 26, right in the, the peak years of his career. There is that Vinaldum shaped hole in the midfield. Could he be the man to fill it? Well, it's an interesting one. They said it, Liverpool have been fairly firm about suggesting that, that there's not really an interest there, or you know they, they don't think it's a doable deal because of suggestions about what his wage packet is. And I think if you know if he was on two hundred and fifty grand a week, which is what the suggestion is, um, then that would be a difficult deal to do just because of the the options they've already got in midfield. You know, you think. Most games next season, you're going to go into with a Fabinho, Jordan Henderson, Thiago. Obviously, Sol would would come in and, and very much challenge in that area. But I don't, I don't necessarily think Liverpool want that. They maybe want someone who's in the the Jota bracket of maybe 23, 24 comes in with a, with a view to sort of being the main man in two or three years' time. Um, and, and you know, Sol is is probably he's in his peak now, isn't he? Or just coming into it. So you know it's maybe a difficult one, and like I say, because of the because of the wage packet as well, maybe a difficult one to see. But I wouldn't entirely rule it out, and the reason I don't believe them necessarily is because I just think they've had an interest in him for for a long time. He's a player they really like and have liked. You know, maybe there's a, a thing in there that that you know you could just get a fourth really high quality option, go as strong in in depth in central midfield as they they have it at centre half, for example, and. And give themselves a real, you know, top quality option. And there's also a suggestion in, in other reports I've been reading in Spain as well that his his wages actually are around 125,000. Now, if that's true, then it really does present me as a, a you know, to me as a, a deal that could be done. So, yeah, you know, Liverpool pushing it down at the moment, but it, but it's not one I would completely rule out. I think the fact that they've liked him for such a long time, they, they obviously think he profiles well in terms of fitting into to Jurgen Klopp's system. It just suggests that. You know, if there is a deal to be done and Atletico have got to sort of clear their wage bill a little bit and get some money in, then you know maybe Liverpool would 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 have a go at it. Yeah, the things to me that sort of no smoke without fire with this one, Joe, is in terms of he signed a nine-year contract. What four years ago? He's still got five years to run on that, and yet he's he's kind of you you've got a forty million pound fee being banded about. You've got to play with a five-year contract left, who's sort of a of his quality in his peak years, you would have thought the fee being reported would be far higher. Yeah, so whose dog was that, by the way? That was, that was, that, yeah, that was my dog. dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hoping Actually, it was someone else's because I don't have a dog, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, Lynch, you looked around and I thought, he's never mentioned it. he's got a dog. Anyway, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's usually my dog interrupting the podcast. Yeah, no, do you know what? I don't know too much about him. and He's a gritty player, isn't he? And I, and I think yeah. Liverpool needs someone who's sort of gritty and reliable because... Genie Van Adams just walked out the door and he would fit in well. Um, for me, you know, look, Liverpool, let's face it, Liverpool distanced themselves from Thiago Alcantara last summer, pretty much all summer, but clearly liked him and clearly were waiting for a chance to make a deal happen and, and did it when it came along. So, you know, I think, yes, I think Liverpool have a profile of player that they like to sign. They like to sign younger players, but I think they've got to a point in the, in the way that the squad is, is shaped now that, 
if there is a player that they've liked for a long time that is slightly older but is affordable, they've shown that they'll go and do a deal. So, like then she says, I, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be surprised. Um, they do have a, a hole in the squad for someone like that. But look, I don't know. It's, it's it's difficult, isn't it? It's all about whether you know they can make all the finances fit. And right now, as we've said a few times, I don't think Liverpool are going to go out and, and, and sign someone until players leave. And I think, you know, that starts with someone like a Marco Gurich, who, you know, has, has been around for a long time, but Liverpool know they can command a decent fee for him. Um, but, you know, until someone like that leaves and they get some money in, I don't think they'll be going out and spending. So I just think it's a bit of a waiting game right now. And I think this, this pre-season um, camp is the first step of Liverpool sizing up some of those players, sorting out some futures. And then I think after these Euros finish, we'll start to see things to happen so you know say if someone like Marco Gurich leaves someone like Har- uh, Harry Wilson leaves um, in the next few weeks then we might start to see Liverpool show the hand a bit but I'd still be slightly surprised if it was for Sal Niguez. Yeah Lynchley seems to be having some technical yeah. issues for, for those watching he keeps dropping on and off screen so, so Joe we'll, we'll just continue and I mean you're mentioning there about players may well have to leave before others sort of come into the Liverpool thinking during the course of pre-season. But everybody's talking about or hoping that, that Liverpool will sign a forward player, may sign a midfielder. Do you think there's probably more certainty of a midfielder arriving, given a lot of the links we're seeing fly around? We saw with, with Neuhaus, Otavio uh, at Porto as well. A lot of midfield players being linked that it's probably more likely we'll, we'll see a midfield player rather than a forward, certainly at the moment. The, the way things are shaping up? Um, it seems that way. It, it, it's one of them. I, I honestly think, as I said before, I think Harvey Elliott is probably a big part of Liverpool's thinking. They want to get him back, have a proper look at him and probably decide a bit of a plan with him. And then, yeah, I think in midfield, you know, now why now has gone and, you know, I think they will sell Gruwich. Um, there will be there will be a chance for Liverpool to do something there. And yeah, I mean... <sighs> Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a midfielder next. But again, as I said before, I don't think it will be until they start selling players. And once we see a couple of departures, yeah, you might see Liverpool show their hand. And what's your take on it, Lynchy? I don't know if you, you how much of that you caught, but basically a, a midfielder more than a, a forward player at the moment. I think, to be honest, I, I just think both both areas are something Liverpool are, are looking at, and, and and I think the the log jam really at the moment. The, the, the problem is 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 needing to sort of get some players off the books. I don't think it's you know the the sell to buy thing is, is is overblown. I don't think Liverpool are skins or anything like that. I just think it's a case of you know they, they know that the size of the squad is maybe a little bit big at the moment, and they they will need you know you can't have say someone like Jordan Shakiri of someone of his quality and experience in your squad, and then add another forward on top of that before you move him on. I don't think that's fair, and I don't think it's a reflection on on him as a player to, to do that and leave yourself in that position. So I think you just want some more guarantees about, you know, who's going out and, you know, in midfield, like you say, is Marco Gruic to maybe move on at, at you know, Takumi Minamino, if you talk about him as an attacking midfielder, maybe. Um, and in terms of your forward line, Origi and Shakiri as well, there's, there's interest there. And so I think until those sort of start moving on and I don't know what's going to start moving first, then I think Liverpool are just sort of, you know, keeping the cards close to the chest and wait until until that happens. I think you know, speaking to agents as well, there's there's a sort of general opinion that the that the market is a little bit jammed at the moment. That that a lot of clubs are doing that because money's still you know it's still pandemic affected market. Um, you know, you just need a couple of big moves to go through, and then you'll start to see a little bit more movement. I think. Yeah, you talk people about, always get yeah. sorry. People always get quite twitchy at this time of year, don't they? And say, yeah, you know, I had a friend said to me the other day, "There's you know, Liverpool have hardly done any business or something. Who's done business? You know, this summer." You know, United obviously have done a, a big headline grabbing deal, but you know, other than that, there's not much, been much go, going on at all. And like, and she says, I think once one or two deals fall into place, you know, not perhaps Sancho, you know, might be might be one of the sort of the start to domino effect. You might start seeing things move around. And you know, for Liverpool, I, you know, I keep looking at players like I know I've mentioned them a few times, but a player like Rich is someone that Liverpool know that they can get a decent fee for. As soon as people like him start start moving and I think they will soon then things will start things will start moving for Liverpool the other way and again I, I totally agree with Lynch I don't think Liverpool I think this idea that it's just to sell to buy is a little bit overblown I think it's just not how Liverpool operate they don't they don't have this big swollen squad with players who you know are on big amounts of money who just sit there and never play a single game if they've got players they tend to use them don't they so 
I, I think it's just not the way Liverpool operate. They won't be, they won't pack their squad full of people and just allow the likes of Chikiri to sort of rot in the reserves. You know, they they will they will either use them or move them on. So I think things will start moving, but you know, we often don't see the transfer market start to move till the end of this month, start next, do we? Yeah, it's also one of those, isn't it, that, that players aren't just commodities. They they are people there. And as you say, if you have somebody who's classed as dead wood just around the place, if they start grumbling a few murmurs of discontent, it, it can spread within the squad, can't it? And Liverpool won't want to find themselves in, in that position. But talking of the pandemic and the effect it's had maybe on, on valuations and, and fees and this, that and the other, Adama Traore is another one that reports have sort of resurfaced with Lynch. He was being spoken about this time last year as a £100 million player, now £25 million. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, even when the reports around his, some of the ridiculous valuations that were getting thrown around last season, I don't think he's ever touched those heights, to be honest. I think he's a perfectly good player, been you know really impressive for Wolves, probably better than I expected when he went there, to be honest. And he, he has kicked on into, you know, he, he got a bit of a reputation as just a pay, pace merchant, didn't he? And not, you know, not a particularly classy footballer, but I think in that system at Wolves had really suited him and he's, he, you know, he'd really come on. Um, but I still don't think he's a player that Liverpool have, have ever sort of considered. I don't think, you know, given his age, he doesn't score a lot of goals for for a winger, does he? And, and you know, Liverpool's whole system is set up around getting goals from out wide. You've basically got two centre forwards playing out in the wide positions. Um, and Trio, he's he's definitely not that. He's very much a get to the byline and try and stand up across for a, for a big number nine. And Liverpool just just don't really play that way, did he? So. I've never sort of thought of him as a realistic target. I think the fact that they're trying to shift him for 25 million now does to sort of give you an indication about how clubs might want to sort of, sort of start getting money in and, and things are a little bit more difficult at the moment. So, you know, that, that sort of tells you a lot, I think, about the, the financial state of the, the Premier League or, or clubs across Europe, really. So it's an interesting one. But yeah, not really one I'd, I'd ever sort of link with Liverpool or think he would end up there. Yeah, what's what's your take on it, Joe? Because I I kind of thought last year I can't really see that one, but then maybe it was a smokescreen for Diogo Jota. But now it might be kind of as, as, as they suggest. There, Wolves want some money, put Liverpool's name on it. It might bring some attractors to him. Yeah, I, I must admit, I don't see Liverpool ever signing a Darmstrey. All right, I just think he's one of those players. They come along every now and again, don't they? That, that will get linked with the club almost every single transfer window, and that club never has any interest in signing them. And I think there are other forwards at Wolves that Liverpool would much prefer to sign than, than Adama Traore. He just seems to be a good commodity for them, doesn't he? I don't know whether it's his playing style, but he seems to want be the one that every summer or every January people talk about and that there seems to be a fee attached to. But, you know, I, th- I think Pedro Neto is probably better. I think Fabio mm-hmm. Silva is probably a better player, or albeit a different player. But as Lynch, she says, that Liverpool just don't play in the style that Adama Traore plays, does it? They, they, they don't play with like these out and out wingers that run down the, the touchline. So I just don't think he's ever someone that has ever interested Liverpool. I just think it's a, an easy one. And whether that's agents, I don't know, but it just seems to be an easy link. But then he, he's linked with a lot of big clubs, isn't he? Um, again, I just think it's down to his playing style. He just has that bit of character around him that people seem to like and he seems to maybe generate hits. Yeah, he's been linked with Chelsea as well, isn't he? Um, they're looking for a for a, a right wing back, seemingly as well. But yeah, I, I have to say it, it wouldn't strike me as a, a Liverpool kind of deal whatsoever. But before we go, just a, a very quick word, of course, international final on Sunday coming up. And Joe, I'm sure, knowing how much you love international football, you'll want to wish the lads good luck in their final. Of course, I'm talking about Alisson, Fabinho and Roberto Firmino. <laughs> you did me there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I, you know, I'm not going to go over it. I think it just bore people and, and people like yourself. I know are very, very into in, in England, but just absolutely no interest. Couldn't care less who wins on Sunday. And you know, it's just it's a it's look. It's a cultural thing. I think you know anyone that lives lives in and around Liverpool, there'd be a lot of people that feel the same as me. Um, you know, you know that. Look, let's just not get into it. It's a, it's a it's a bit of a bad ground to go over. But yeah, you know what. If England win, I would do it for, you know, Jordan Anderson does it, you know, because I think he deserves it. And um, obviously I hope the Brazilian players do it as well. But yeah, couldn't care less. 
No, I know. I was only pulling your leg. That's why I was asking you about the Brazilian boys. But of course, they are in action as well. But anyway, that's that's all we time for here on this edition of the Blood Red podcast. Of course, there is Copper America and Euros finals actions to take place over the course of the weekend. And then on Monday, Liverpool are back in pre-season action. We'll be back with the next Blood Red podcast on Monday afternoon. Hope you can join us then. But from myself, Guy Clark, Joe Rimmer and David Lynch, thanks for your time and your company. It's bye for now. This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo.